New here at noon, UPS says it's cutting about 12,000 jobs. Managers and contractor positions will make up most of them, but it's unclear where those cuts will be. On a conference call this morning, the company's CEO said reducing the company's headcount will help save a billion dollars after issuing a disappointing sales outlook for this year. UPS is also returning to a policy of having its employees back in the office five days a week. Last year, union members at UPS voted to approve a tentative contract agreement, putting a final seal on that contentious labor negotiation that threatened to disrupt package deliveries for millions of businesses and households nationwide. A spokesperson from UPS here in Louisville told us the company will provide support to all affected employees, including the severance packages and outplacement assistance. There are concerns over the lawsuit against River City Firearms filed by the survivors and victims of the old National Bank mass shooting. The Louisville shop sold the gunman the rifle he used, and the lawsuit claims it should have noticed the shooter's odd behavior. Attorneys say that store prioritized profits over safety by ignoring red flags and upselling accessories to the shooter. Ian Hardwood spoke with a former gun range owner in Oldham County who disagrees with these claims. There's no magazine in there, and I'm going to check the chamber. There's nothing in the chamber. Right now, this gun is unloaded. We do not call it safe. Barry Laws was a handgun safety instructor in California before his 18 years of running open range in Oldham County. He just retired from that business. Thought, geez, I need a better place to live that's more friendly to firearms, so moved to Kentucky. Now he's concerned about a lawsuit filed against a former competitor, River City Firearms. But if there's something that's not a law and there's something we're not trained upon, no, that's not fair game for a lawsuit. The lawsuit, representing victims and families of people lost in the mass shooting at Old National Bank, claims a customer in the store noticed the gunman, Connor Sturgeon, acting strange when he bought the rifle later used at the bank. So strange, that customer considered calling police. And if it was that terrible, why didn't they call the police? Laws acknowledged the pain felt by those who suffered from the mass shooting, but placed responsibility on the shooter, not the store who sold him the gun. Using a mission statement from the ATF, the lawsuit attempts to place responsibility on River City Firearms by stating federal firearms licensees are the first line of defense in preventing firearms from getting into the hands of criminals. However, the ATF doesn't regulate gun stores when it comes to spotting someone who's mentally ill. They look at other functions of any firearms business, like record keeping. I'm not doing a background check. Uh, uh, transferring a firearm to somebody who's prohibited from possessing one, um, uh, not maintaining safe inventory, not uh, responding to law enforcement's uh, request for information. The ATF did say they offer regular seminars if store owners have any questions. But as far as any other specific training, as far as psychology training, no, there's absolutely nothing. Ultimately, it's up to each individual business to decide who they will sell to. In Louisville, Ian Hardwick, WHAS 11, on your side. Attorneys for the survivors and families appeared in court yesterday regarding that lawsuit. During a short hearing, the judge approved a motion to redact the names of the victim's children from that court file. We did reach out to River City Firearms when that lawsuit was released last week. The store declined to comment. It's been a hard week for the Nelson County community, which suffered multiple losses and separate incidents over the weekend. Major Brandon Bryan said a 13-year-old boy was found unresponsive in his room and died despite his parents' efforts to try and revive him. No foul play is suspected there. And then a 16-year-old girl named Lily Smith was killed in a crash when she lost control of her car on wet pavement along Woodlawn Road. The Nelson County Dispatch Group posted the news to social media acknowledging how difficult that this has also been on first responders. A community-wide vigil is planned for Thursday at 6.45 p.m. in front of the Nelson County Justice Center. This afternoon, former NBA basketball player Rajon Rondo is out on bond after being arrested in Indiana. On Sunday, a state trooper pulled over Rondo in Jackson County for speeding at about 100 miles an hour and having no license plate. When the trooper approached his car, he said he noticed a smell of marijuana. Police then said he inspected that car, found marijuana and drug paraphernalia along with a firearm. His son was also a passenger. Rondo is prohibited from possessing a gun due to a protection order in place against him in 2022. He was arrested for violating that order.
Indiana State Police say a deadly shooting in Salem was in self-defense. Despite their initial report, Indiana Police say no one was ever charged in that shooting last weekend. ISP said it happened just after midnight on Sunday. Officers responded to a home on North College Avenue in downtown Salem where they found 29-year-old Jacob Mitchell dead from a gunshot wound. ISP said three people were in the home at the time of the shooting, including 24-year-old Blake Henry, who was arrested. The Washington County Prosecutor's Office said witnesses told police Mitchell hit Henry multiple times and was in a fit of rage when he was shot. Henry has since been released. Linden police are looking into a serious crash that killed one person and sent another to the hospital. It happened around 1230 yesterday afternoon at the intersection of Westport Road and Linden Lane. That's in the Graymore Devondale neighborhood. Police said several cars were involved. One person died at the scene. It's unclear how badly the other person was injured. New court documents filed in the Jamie Knoll case are offering insight into a series of search warrants executed on Friday. Indiana State Police searched six of the fire departments the former Clark County Sheriff used to oversee, looking for information on 11 specific vehicles. Investigators say Knoll bought three trucks and one ambulance for the county from federal government in 2015. Then they say he transferred them to his nonprofit for zero dollars later that year. The documents also accuse Knoll of selling a truck from his nonprofit to the sheriff's department, paying himself out of the jail commissary fund. Knoll is charged with 15 felonies connected to fraud, theft and misconduct and has pleaded not guilty. New Albany City Council is one step closer to voting on a proposal that could impact the city's housing. Members met to discuss the mayor's call for a pause on new apartments and short-term rentals. Right now in New Albany, 57% of people own their own home. Most of those people are married couples and families. That's according to the census numbers, with the average person paying more than $900 a month in rent. Our Alexis Jones and photojournalist Alyssa Newton were at Monday's meeting speaking with residents and leaders. What began as a recommendation from New Albany's mayor. We've asked the city council to consider a moratorium. Is now moving through committee. All in favor signify by saying aye. All right. Aye. City Council members gathered Monday to discuss a potential pause on multifamily apartments and short-term rentals. The idea was birthed from a housing study done by U of L. Results show New Albany should focus its efforts on increasing single-family homes. Since the last comprehensive plan was adopted in 2017, the city has seen an unbalanced housing stock, according to this diagram. 20% of new construction has been single-family. 73%. New construction has been apartment unit, units and 7% has been public housing. With that being said, committee member Chris Fitzgerald is in favor of Mayor Jeff Gahan's recommendation, despite not being a fan of moratoriums. I think level setting is uh, imperative so that we have a variety and a, and a thriving community. Resident Alika Redman agrees, adding rentals are stunting the city's growth. We need homeowners. We don't need more apartments. We need an opportunity for even our low-income families to find a way so that they can purchase and then start paying back into the city. The more people invest in the city, the better it will be for the city as a whole. However, before Redmond can fully back the zoning ordinance, she says she needs more information from leaders. So far, city council share the moratorium will pause construction for a year. It would also prevent developers from gaining new permits to build multifamily homes. Council President Adam Dickey says this will give officials time to improve New Albany's land use. And then to come up with some good common sense uh, reforms that may help us to incentivize our housing. Ultimately ensuring the city continues to grow in the right direction. City Council plans to vote on the zoning ordinance in the weeks to come, but before then they will hear from the public starting Tuesday night. In New Albany, Alexis Jones, WAJS 11, on your side. The Planning Commission will meet for the public hearing tonight at 7, then that moratorium will be up for consideration on February 5th.